This episode is brought to you by New Balance. Hey, it's Elena Samuela. As a running and strength coach, my life revolves around movement, but not necessarily for the reasons you'd think. Thanks to New Balance, I run for my mind just as much as my body. There's kind of this meditational aspect to running. It makes for the most inspiring and the most emotionally charged runs. Head to newbalance.com slash beyond the run to explore the power of movement. On this episode of Winfluence. When Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all these things emerged, that's really when we got focused away from the website as the sole destination for your customer experience. And we had a very decentralized, very fragmented customer experience. And the same thing now is happening with commerce. It used to be like, oh, I drive everybody to my website to pay me. And now people are going to expect and consumers expect to transact in the destination site that they're in, whether that be Instagram, whether it be your website, whether it be YouTube, whatever that may be. And so Instagram knows that and they have leaned very, very heavily into commerce tools to basically reduce the friction in how your customers can discover your products and services and transact without leaving the Instagram platform. There's a difference between being an influencer and actually influencing. I'm Jason Falls, and in this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate that difference. Welcome to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. If you read the tea leaves of the conversations people are having about social media channels these days, you'd probably think TikTok was dominant, Instagram was struggling, YouTube was relevant, and everything else was dead. But the way the conversations go and reality aren't always aligned. HubSpot published two reports over the last couple of months specific to Instagram. One was its 2022 Instagram engagement report. The other was a report specific to shopping on the platform. Both reports offered up reminders that not only do consumers still prefer Instagram over TikTok and other platforms, but so do marketers. But research reports come out weeks and sometimes months after the surveys and data analysis is done, and social media often changes by the day. So are HubSpot's Instagram reports even still valid? Well, the short answer is yes. Consumer trends often take months to shift. Instagram is still bigger and used by more people than TikTok, though that gap is closing. And the perception of Instagram's waffling wasn't helped when its CEO came out recently and said, make more vertical video in an obvious attempt to compete with TikTok-like content. But I wanted to dig in deeper to the information and question it a bit. When I do that, I like to go to the source. I invited my old pal Kip Bodner, who is now Chief Marketing Officer at HubSpot, to sit in with me and talk Instagram, TikTok, and more. I asked him if he was concerned at all the survey data might be old the day it was published, if Instagram is still relevant, and a lot more. We also dug into the shopping report a bit to talk about how marketers are leveraging those features to turn Instagram into a frictionless shopping app while also being a fun social network. Kip Bodner and HubSpot's Instagram data is coming up on Winfluence. This is the point in the show where I tell you a little something about Tagger, our presenting sponsor. It is a complete influencer marketing software package I use every day to find, engage, hire, collaborate, review, and measure all my influence marketing efforts. I've started a new campaign for a client in Tagger this week and am finally building out a full campaign management project using all of the tool's capabilities. I normally still do emails and approvals and such outside of the platform, but this campaign is more of a scaled project with dozens of creators, so I'm leaning more on Tagger for this one. So I set up the campaign, and in 10 minutes, I have a campaign brief, an invitation email for creators, the triggered responses if they apply, an expected content flow that automatically gives me a checklist per creator to ensure they fulfill the campaign obligations. It's really kind of crazy how organized and useful Tagger is. Now, I could go on, but you know I use Tagger every day. You should check it out, too. It might be right for your agency or brand. Go to jason.online slash tagger to get a free demo and see if Tagger is right for you. No obligation, just do the demo. You get to see cool software, worst case scenario, best case scenario, you find a better solution for influence marketing efforts for what you're doing. The URL again, jason.online slash tagger. Go check it out. Is Instagram still the 800-pound gorilla in the room? 
We'll dig into HubSpot's latest Instagram reports with CMO Kip Bodner. He's next on Winfluence. LinkedIn believes B2B marketing can be B2 brilliant, B2 bold, and B2 breakthrough. How? With a platform purpose built to make B2B mean more for your business. A platform with tools to help you build better relationships with your key customers, to boost your buyer journey while building your brand. A platform with the trusted data and lead generation you need to beat KPIs, drive ROI, and stand out amongst the competition. And with the targeting tools on LinkedIn, you can reach your precise audience right down to their job title, company name, location, and more to make sure your ads are always being seen by those who matter. So get ready to be to boldly go where no marketers have gone before. Because LinkedIn is where B2B is everything it can be. Rethink your B2B marketing LinkedIn ads and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. My man, Kip, it's been a minute, man. Thanks for taking some time out of being a big shot to catch up today. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to hear that, Jason Falls. How you doing? <laughs> Glad to be here. That's good, man. Hey, I've got to start out by asking a question that for people who don't know you and me and that we've known each other for a long time, they probably might think this is disrespectful. And I don't mean it that way. And you know I don't mean it that way. <laughs> but when you were sitting in my office interviewing for a position at an agency umpteen years ago, did you ever think you would wind up being the CMO of a hugely successful publicly traded company like Upscott? Because no, of course not. <laughs> I obviously had no idea because I didn't offer you the job. <laughs> it's true. I just chose to use that as motivation, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm responsible for your success. Yeah, I just want to credit it all to you, Jason. No, obviously, I didn't think that was going to happen. You know, me, I'm just a curious person. And I was just obsessed with the internet and wanted to learn. And man, it turns out that can lead to some really good things if you're willing to work hard and put your head down and learn a bunch of stuff, which I, I don't know, I'm the luckiest person in the world. So in that regard, I'm very happy. Well, you've been the CMO at HubSpot now for a little over seven years, I think. And back then you were kind of thrown into a, a position and there might've been some people outside of HubSpot who didn't know you and that you'd been there for a long time and how capable you were who thought, who is this kid who's the CMO? So I wonder how long did it take you to feel like you the job fit, to feel like you were where you were supposed to be, or was that just kind of natural from the from the get go? No, no, I think that's I think it's a good that's a good call out, Jason. Like I think I heard from a lot of people with that with that perspective that you just outlined. And what's fascinating is I think it really took twelve to eighteen months to like really get settled in. And you know, if you juxtapose that with like most CMOs only being in role on average for like eighteen months, you're like, oh man, <laughs> how is anybody ever successful? Right? Like one of the things I've learned is that you like any problem of substance takes a while to solve, right? Like you can't just do it in six to 12 months. It takes years to solve. And if you don't have that continuity with people who have the context and are up to speed on the problems, then man, you're just like constantly on this hamster wheel of rebuilding. Yeah. Well, I know both you and HubSpot continue to be leaders in the digital space. I've known the company, Darmesh and Brian and mm -hmm. crew since the early days. I've always been a big fan. HubSpot's really defined what inbound marketing is and changed the way a lot of companies do business online. So kudos all around to you and, and the team there. Now, in, in that great work, you and your team published the 2022 Instagram engagement report not long ago. It's an yep. analysis of millions of Instagram posts and accounts and gives folks a nice look at some insights about arguably the top social media network for influencers and content creators. Before I dive in, what were the data points in the engagement report that jumped out at you? What surprised you about that? Honestly, Jason, you know, I kind of want to go with the statement you just made is like, I was curious as to if Instagram still had it. I'm somebody who's increasingly spending a lot more time on YouTube and YouTube shorts, TikTok. And I was like, I was surprised by how relevant and how strong some of the core metrics in that report was because the shine on Instagram for me personally had kind of dulled as a marketing channel. Not that I didn't know that it was important, but it just felt like 
it was potentially being usurped by YouTube, by TikTok, by some of these core platforms. And the data really shows that that's not really the case in the way that I was maybe perceiving it to be. And I think that's a great lesson for all of us out there. As marketers, you can get distracted on like the thing people are talking about in the moment, but it's really important to get in the details and the data to see how are people actually using a platform and how are they engaging with each other on it. Well, and the report asserts that Instagram is the top social media platform for ROI engagement, lead gen via video content and all that good stuff. YouTube and TikTok closely behind, however. I wonder, though, if we might worry the data is even outdated as it was published. I mean, I know the report's just a couple months old, but TikTok just seems to be growing at rates few networks have for a long time. How concerned to our brands or creators, how concerned do they need to be that Instagram is in danger of not being the top platform much longer because when you did that poll, you know, it takes a few weeks for that to come out and be published. And in a few weeks, shit can change. Yeah. And if I was a brand, I would be concerned. Right. And I think that's what you and I are here talking about where you're like, wow, the, the changing landscape of all of this is dramatic. And the rate of change has never been faster. And I think what's hard for brands now is to kind of even level set a little bit more. I think a lot of brands were spending most of their time on channels that both were very good at driving influence as well as driving kind of very high attributable work, whether that be the core Facebook platform, the core Google platform, for example. And now, whether it be Instagram, whether it be TikTok, that attribution in terms of like kind of direct ROI is way, way harder, right? And because of that, I think the marketers I talk to, the marketing leaders I talk to are having a struggle of like how to invest on one side. And the other thing, quite frankly, is the data privacy side of this. There are a lot of concerns with both Instagram and TikTok on how those products are going to have to evolve in the changing world of data privacy that Apple is really driving and pushing hard in the market and kind of holding Google and Meta and TikTok's feet to the fire on a lot of this, you know? And so if, if I'm a brand and I'm a marketer, I'm like, oh, I need to know that this landscape is going to change by the weeks and months, not by the years, right? And I'm going to have to have consistent access to data to help me understand where I need to spend my time. Yeah. One thing that uh, has changed significantly about Instagram, even really since this report came out, is that the platform itself has come out overtly and said, post more video. They're feeling the pressure yes. from TikTok, stealing you know content consumption time from them and prioritizing video content. Your report, though, seemed to foreshadow that a bit, right? I mean, Instagram users engage with video more. Look, I think whether it's Instagram or not, we, I think, can know as marketers now that short form video is the preferred consumer format, right? And you saw that in the the report with, with the Instagram data. You're seeing that with the growth of TikTok. You're seeing that with how hard YouTube is leading into its shorts product and making it a core tab on the core mobile app and just like making it a huge part of that user experience. And I think the bigger issue here is that most brands aren't equipped to thrive in a short form video world because it takes a different pace. It takes a different kind of proactivity. It's a daily, daily to hourly beat versus a weekly to monthly beat, which I think a lot of brands when it comes to social and comes to influencer are normally used to operating on that slower time. I don't know. You work with huge amount of brands, Jason. Like, you think that's true? Do you think folks are set up to be successful in short form? I don't think they are. In fact, we talked to Lena Katz not too long ago from Ampersand, and we talked specifically about that, how the traditional ad creative, you know, that went to art school and, you know, works in an ad agency is kind of handcuffed and crippled. They don't really understand. Not only do they not under, not a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them not only don't understand that sort of vertical video, which is alien to them. And then they also don't understand, oh, wait, it's not just video. You can lay over stickers and links and other things with it. And then they don't get the whole social sharing. It's all for them. It's all about brand, 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 message, 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 message. And on social, that kind of gets watered down and pushed to the side so that you can be really engaging. And I think that's where a lot of ad agencies and a lot of brands are struggling right now as they look at this short form video and it's just alien to them. They don't really understand how to translate it. Well, and there's there's the second part of that. It's the format. Everything you just said, I think, was totally right. Then the flip side of that is the algorithm side of that, which is Mm -hmm. so dynamic. Whether you're talking about the Discover tab on Instagram, whether you're talking about the For You tab on TikTok, you have to build a content strategy playbook that is very connected to the zeitgeist of the world. 
I host a podcast called Marketing Against the Grain. We had a, a big TikTok influencer on there, and she was talking to us about like how she watches the algorithm, how she knows if she has a breakout video, she has to double down because things related to that video then start to really take off. And I think the other, the kind of the third thing here is brands are also just like, okay, cool, I did something good onto the next thing. And they don't double down on like the, no, I found the thing that really hit with the audience in this moment in the zeitgeist, and I need to double down on that for the next week or two weeks or three weeks. Yeah, and if if you're looking at a TikToker or someone, a content creator out there who they do a really cool video on how to organize your closet, and then they do 17 more on how to organize your closet or this little corner of your closet, that's what's happening. They're watching what's working, and then they're jumping on that bandwagon. So it's a smart way to do it, and brands need to pay attention. We're talking to HubSpot CMO Kip Bodner about the 2022 Instagram engagement report, but we're going to shift to its new data about Instagram shopping next. Don't go away. One day in the metaverse, urban planners will model traffic solutions to help decrease commute times. The metaverse may be virtual, but the impact will be real. Learn more at meta.com slash metaverse impact. Back on Winfluence with Kip Bodner. He's the chief marketing officer at the Big Orange Spoke HubSpot. <laughs> Before we took the break, we jumped into a little bit of the 2022 Instagram engagement report. But a subsequent data set and report that followed was the Instagram shopping report. Kip, 37% of brands of the, I think, 580 Instagram marketers HubSpot surveyed actually use Instagram shopping tools. But that means 63% do not. For those that don't, just in case, walk us through the various shopping mechanisms Instagram has for brands so they know what we're talking about. Yeah, so Instagram shopping at the high level for everybody listening is their features are trying to integrate commerce into a social platform, a community platform, and Instagram. And what I want everybody to understand is I believe that digital commerce, whether you're a consumer or B2B brand, is the most untapped opportunity in the world today. I see it every day as a consumer where I'm trying to, you know, pay for something that, you know, a job that got done on my house. And it's like a root canal to like find an invoice, pay an invoice. Am I going to write a check? Am I going to write a check for this thing? Is that what's actually going to happen? It's like, how, how am I actually going to do this? And that's the expectation now. And I think what happened is it's an iteration of the web experience. So when Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all these things emerged. That's really when we got away from the website as the sole destination for your customer experience. And we had a very decentralized, very fragmented customer experience. And the same thing now is happening with commerce. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be like, oh, I drive everybody to my website to pay me. If I'm lucky, I drive people to my website to pay me. A lot of people, like I drive some people to some offline experience to pay me. And now people are going to expect and consumers expect to transact in the destination site that they're in, whether that be Instagram, whether it be their web, your website, whether it be YouTube, whatever that may be. And so Instagram knows that and they have leaned very, very heavily into commerce tools to basically reduce the friction in how your customers can discover your products and services and transact without leaving the Instagram platform. Well, and so what that means is you might have mechanisms, whether it's a brand or a content creator, either one, if they're plugged in and selling their own products or have some sort of affiliate relationship Mm -hmm. with brands, they can plug in these commerce mechanisms and you could be looking at an Instagram story and there's a button you can click to open up and buy whatever shirt that person's wearing or whatever the product is. So you can do that in stories. You can do it in videos. You can do it in static posts. There's lots of mechanisms now that they're building out to make Instagram a shoppable experience. But I love the one sort of mechanism and platform that marketers say works best. Which one is it? Instagram Live. Instagram Live is very interesting, Jason, because we are so digitally fatigued and scroll fatigued that the scarcity of that live experience. And what's interesting to me and like something I talk about in the background with people is that like, it's kind of funny. Like if you think back in the day when you and I were younger, younger lads, there was this thing called the Home Shopping Network. There are these things called infomercials, all of these things that were massive tools for commerce. And they haven't actually been fully reinvented 
on the social and digital age that we live in now. And Instagram Live is, is a great tool for that because it is kind of like a modern day influencer living driven, not home shopping network, but a way to share expertise and bundle commerce as part of that, right? To show you the value and utility of something and understand that, hey, if you want to be a great rock climber like me, or if you want to be great at this DIY project, here's what you need. And here are the tools of the trade to actually go and do that well. Yeah. Well, I mean, Instagram Live is a combination of content mechanisms that I think a lot of brands find challenging. Yes. First of all, you know, here, here we go again with video and probably vertical video. <laughs> now we're going to add live to that. So, you know, what is it about that live experience that makes the difference, all the difference and what kind, yeah. what kind of pressure and challenges do brands have to account for if they're now having to say, okay, I got to come up with a live shopping experience on Instagram. What pressure does that put them under? puts it a lot of pressure, but I think you first need to understand why people like that experience. And people like that experience because one, it's scarce. They have to be in that moment with you. And because it's scarce and because it's live and because you can't edit things out, which is some of the pressure that it puts on brands, it's also deeply authentic, right? It feels like they're getting special access to this individual, to this brand, to this new exciting innovation or product or whatever you might be sharing with them. And that is really special. And especially for your super fans, your, your, your truly engaged members of your audience, your community, like that's a huge value. If you're a brand, however, the margin for, mer- for error is like 10 times more than on the recorded side. But I think there's also opportunities. Like you can bring other folks in, you can bring other influencers in, you can have a much richer experience than when you're just posting like pre-edited videos to, to reels and, and things like that, right? And so I think that's the opportunity. The risk is you have to have good talent and you have to be clear on the story you're going to tell live. You still requires a lot of preparation, even more so because you don't have the help of editing in the back end to make everything sound and look perfect. You touched on, you skimmed the surface of kind of my next point was, this is a show about creators and influencers. So, you know, I'm going to throw it out there. If your brand's a little hesitant about being in front of the camera, not feeling comfortable there, I got some recommendations for you. Are influencers not just the perfect solution for a brand needing to tread in those waters? They could not be more perfect. You know, I think, Jason, one of the things you and I both believe is that to be a relevant brand in the future, you're going to have to align with the best creators in your market. And that is just fundamentally true, I believe. And I think we are undervaluing the opportunity of the creator economy and the impact of creators in this new world that we live in. And so with that, what I would say, if you do not have an ongoing dialogue with the best creators and influencers in your market, even if you're not actively working with them, you are missing a huge opportunity, especially on the highest engagement platforms like Instagram Live, because they're professionals, right? They do this all the time. This is how they make their day-to-day like income living and build their community. So aligning them and getting them on board, even at the start, to help learn from them and start building your presence online is a huge, huge opportunity. Nice. So, Kip, between uh, me, you, and a bag of sticks, uh, these reports are very pro-Instagram, but they are so for a reason. You're filling the information void for your customer base that's been asking about Instagram. I'm curious now, are you furiously working on a TikTok report, and do you want to get those yahoos on the phone and say, hey, slow down, we can only crank these things out so fast? (laughs) So there's a couple things. Like I kind of am starting to rethink how you provide data like this. It helps what part of our marketing is like, how do we deeply educate and inspire the world of marketers and help them do so in a really great way? And I think the thing you're pushing on is like, wow, this data is changing so fast. Like, yes, are we working on TikTok data? Yes. Is a long form report the best way to present it? I don't know. That's the thing that like I'm actually kind of battling with and struggling with. Like, what is the right way to do that and make that all work? It harkens back to the days when HubSpot cranked out all the tools that said, hey, plug your URL in and we'll grade your website and plug your Twitter account in and we'll grade your Twitter account. So I can see the wheels turning a little bit. Well, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we didn't talk about, Jason, is that like if you're going to be great on whether it be Instagram, whether it be TikTok or some other channel, you have to have the right data and inputs on the platform to know that. And and there's the type of insights we shared in this Instagram report, which are awesome, which are kind of the feature level. But also you want to know, like, who are the fastest growing accounts in the market? Who are the fastest growing accounts overall? Like, there's things you want to know so that you can be like, oh, here are the 20 brands that are really nailing this. And what can I go and learn from them? And that is much more dynamic, 
than like a static data dump, you know? And I think we want to work to how do we get those dynamic sets of data in everybody's hands? Nice. Well, Kip, thank you for taking some time to make us smarter today, my friend. Always good to talk to you. Tell folks where they can find you and the wonderful content and products the mothership has to offer on the interwebs. You can learn all about HubSpot CRM at HubSpot.com. You can find me on Twitter at Kip Bodner and wherever you get your podcasts on the Marketing Against the Grain podcast. Nice. I know you got, HubSpot's got a, the HubSpot podcast network, which is, kind of, I guess, competitive, not really with the Marketing Podcast Network, but... You guys were one of the first people that I reached out to or wanted to reach out to and say, hey, I could get all the HubSpot guys who do blogs to come on the Marketing Podcast Network. And I was like, <laughs> ah, damn it, they beat me to it. Well, we, we could talk about a bigger partnership in consolidating networks. I'm up for acquisition. You got a checkbook. I'm good. Uh, yeah, I got, we, got, we got money. I got money, man. I don't know. I got money and know, and know how to do it. I'm trying to, I'm trying to build the, the best business podcast network in the world, man. And that's inclusive of general business, marketing, sales, CS, all of those things. And so I'm totally up for it. Well, I, I have a feeling, friends, we're going to have a follow-up conversation, probably not on the podcast. That <laughs> sounds good. Kip, man, I appreciate you being here, my friend. Let's not let so long lapse next time. How about it? Let's do it. Thanks, Jason. Thanks for having me. Love catching up with Kip, and yes, it is true. I once interviewed him for a job and didn't hire him. The person I did hire wound up being my operations manager for about six years. I hired her three different times, so while I don't regret the decision, I did pass on the eventual CMO of HubSpot. Not my proudest moment as a manager. Kip is such a great guy, though. He and Jeff Cohen, by the way, actually wrote a nice book on B2B content marketing, too. It's a little old now, but I know it's not dated. It's still fresh stuff. So go look him up out there on the interwebs and connect. Get that book. Follow Kip. He's a great guy. Speaking of connecting, ladies and gentlemen, I need your help getting more people to connect to Winfluence. Tell someone who might want to know more about Influence Marketing, about this podcast, send them to winfluencepod.com or share a link to this episode on your social network of choice. If you have a moment, drop Winfluence a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. We're on them all, and those ratings and reviews help people find us when they're going looking for information about influencers or influencer marketing on their favorite podcast app that they use. So, also, you can help make a future episode of Winfluence Awesome. Ask your question about influence or influence marketing that you want my answer to or take on. Send an email to jason at jasonfalls.com. If you're feeling adventurous, record a voice memo on your phone and email me that file. I'll let you ask the question right here on the show using that recording. Winfluence is a production of Falls and Partners. The technical production is by podcasting360.com. Winfluence airs along the Marketing Podcast Network. Thanks for listening, folks. Let's talk again soon on Winfluence. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is an audio companion to my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my periodic newsletter or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. And if you need help with your influence marketing strategy, drop me a line at jason at jasonfalls.com. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results... It's Winfluence. This podcast is coming to you on MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network. There's another show on MPN you might want to check out. I'm Dave Delaney, the host of The Nice Podcast. Each episode is about communication, collaboration, and becoming better leaders of today's fastest growing tech companies. Subscribe to The Nice Podcast today. It'll make your marketing that much smarter. Just visit nicepodcast.co or search for The Nice Podcast with Dave Delaney wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.com.